You're the founder of EnglishAnyone.com and the English Fluency Guide. Today we're going to talk about how I teach my own kids English. Uh, and so we're going to give you a bunch of tips, one, two, three, four, five tips. Uh, these are the things I was thinking about recently as I teach my own children and help them get fluent. Now, even though I am a native, uh, I don't have a lot of time with my kids uh, where they're, they're getting to listen to my English specifically. So I have to be very strategic, I have to be very efficient. So my children uh, spend most of their day speaking Japanese. So their Japanese is going to be at a better level than their English, but their English is still very good. Uh, and so I wanted to talk in this video about how I do that. Oh, well, Arturo is back. Nice to see you there. Hopefully everybody is doing well. Uh, wherever you happen to be. Uh, I want to get right into this and I'll ask questions as we go through. Uh, so this is a live video, but people uh, can obviously go back. I'll save this so people can watch it later. Um, but the, the main thing I want to talk about, you'll, you'll notice this is a theme throughout this whole video, uh, and this is that natives spend a lot of time getting lots of understandable messages. So this is all of the input that natives are getting, uh, and so my kids, they're, they're doing really what it's like, the, the kind of practicing of the language is all of the different things that they're hearing. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you the five specific things that we're doing. I do a lot more than that, uh, but I thought these would be most helpful for you. So these are things that you can do as well. Uh, but again, I do spend a lot of time, uh, the time that I do have with my kids when they're not in school or you know out doing whatever, uh, but focusing on really giving them lots of input and repeating a lot of things, but giving them naturally varied review. This means I'm trying to give them information in different ways, as you'll see in the video. All right, so if you have any questions as we go, let me know. I'll keep my eye on the chat, uh, but I'd like to go through this pretty quickly and you can start using these tips as well. So remember the basic theme, the basic idea is that we want to, uh, unlike most learners, so most adult English learners who think they know the language well, so they think, okay, I, I know this vocabulary, but they can't use it as well as my kids often. Uh, and so you will have this experience because you don't get enough exposure or you're not familiar enough with the language. And that's really what stops people from speaking fluently. So they might know the language, but not know it well enough to speak fluently. All right. So the first thing, uh, what did I want to talk about first? So first thing, this, this might seem like a very basic or simple thing. Uh, and this is just subject verb. Subject verb agreement, subject verb agreement. All right, so very basically this just means you're connecting who you're talking about with what's going on. All right, so I go, we don't say I goes, okay? So this is one of the first things that little kids are learning and especially my younger daughter, we're still practicing a lot of this and I give her lots and lots and lots of examples. So we usually have things like I like, this, or I go here, or I play this, or then this, but we really want to practice a lot with making sure that she can use, so not just my younger daughter, but both of them, can really use this very automatically, very fluently, without thinking and hesitating. Uh, and so especially if they're talking about different people or different things, so we might be watching a movie and like he plays guitar or he likes something, or they like something. This might seem like a simple idea for people, even, you know, especially if you know and you can understand what I'm saying right now. The interesting thing is I will read lots of YouTube comments, get mails from learners, even hear videos from learners where people are making these basic mistakes. And a lot of these things, they, learners are very excited. They want to learn something more advanced all the time when they're still not making these things correctly. Okay, so I really recommend you spend more time with these things, the very foundation of English, especially if it's different from something like your language. So if you don't have subject verb agreement, like in Japanese, we don't have this. So it's not like 
I go, he goes, it's just I go, you go, they go, he go, it go, like that. It doesn't matter who you're talking about. So some languages are a little bit easier. Some languages have other issues, you know, different, different things like that for different languages. But this number one thing that I really spend a lot of time on, I give lots and lots of examples. I might say like, does the marker like this or does the marker like that? So even though the marker might not like something, my kids are getting that input like, ah, we can still use the language that way. Okay, so the marker likes pizza. It sounds like a funny example. Again, I try to give them some silly examples, but the language still works grammatically the same way. Okay, so if you want to spend more time uh, with this, if you, if you still don't feel 100% confident about this kind of thing, so subject verb agreement, and I do see it a lot, uh, I recommend you spend more time with this, all right? So this is really the number one thing that I'm doing with them. We do this a lot, really making sure uh, they understand this. And even having things like, like he uh, and she, he and she do something and understanding that this means they can do something. Uh, but again, I highly recommend you focus on this first. Let me check chat before I go into the next thing here. Nice to see people from all over. Uh, I don't want to get uh, too, let's see. All right, looks like mostly just greetings from people, which is nice. Kamal says, uh, all I'm worried is about my academic writing. I tried hard to improve it for the past two years, but couldn't ace it. Believe me, I'm damn horrible in writing skills, can't even write a good essay. Yeah, well, I would, uh, in that case, I'm sure your writing is okay. You have a few errors in there, but your writing is okay. I would spend time looking at basically, number one, the format of how lessons are, and just look at very simple things without trying to write along. I don't know what you mean by academic, like, do you mean higher level, like graduate school or something, or do you just mean like an essay? Because um, it, it, the essay has like a pretty simple structure. You have some kind of opening where you state some kind of claim. You've got some supporting conclusions about that or some proof. And then you just repeat what you said in the beginning. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Um, but I would recommend you read lots of examples of this. There was an interesting thing uh, a professor of mine did in college. He actually uh, had, he saved old papers that other students had written from previous years and he made those available for us at the library so i could go there and look at other students and how they're writing and obviously you can't just copy what they do but you can see what makes a good paper and so there's markings on it like oh this is a good point and it's a really interesting idea about getting more feedback and even if you're not getting feedback on your own writing you're still here uh, getting examples from other people and seeing how that works all right so look for more examples that's pretty much the answer for for anything like that is looking for examples of how people do it it's like if you want to learn how to make ice cream you should watch other people who make good ice cream and you will learn how to do that as well all right, uh, let's see. Sorry to be late. What's the topic today? The topic today is how do you learn native, uh, native English or how do you learn English like a native? Uh, I've talked about this a lot, but you don't become uh, a native isn't, it, it's not, it's not, oh no, here comes a fire truck or, or an ambulance. <laughs> so being native is not something you're actually born with. You develop native ability to communicate by how you learn. And that means anybody can do this. Obviously, natives spend way more time doing it, but you can become much, uh, a much better speaker if you start learning more like a native, which is what we're talking about in this video. So these are the things that I do uh, when I'm trying to help my two daughters learn English, uh, and then you can do them as well. So the first thing, the first tip over here is just really focusing on subject verb agreement. Even if you think it's boring, even if you think you know it already, if you are still experiencing errors in your speech or you feel unconfident, like, ah, I couldn't, I couldn't quite say that very quickly, really practice that thing. The basic things like this, this is what's going to give you the confidence to, to express yourself in conversations. Because if you don't even feel good about simple things, then more complicated things are going to feel worse. All right, let's see here. Deromi Official says, or Deromi, uh, I also teach English in Colombia, and that's exactly how I do it. I never go beyond advanced topics, but they can't, uh, but they can't use like the simple present properly. Yeah. So again, 
Yeah, it's like it, it makes sense for us. But the reason people struggle with this is because the mind is naturally interested in new things. We always want new. Give me new vocabulary, new stuff. <laughs> but you have to learn to control that uh, and focus on the things like instead of trying to get like a new grammar point, you should get new examples of this same stuff. All right. If you know it well and you use it confidently and fluently, move on. That's fine. But if you don't, focus on this. All right. That's what's going to help you improve. I know uh, a lot of people will, uh, not a lot, but a few people will be worried. They will say, Drew, I'd like to join Fluent for Life, but I'm worried it's too easy. I'm worried it might be too easy for me. And I say, well, uh, if you know the language already, but you're not speaking, the problem is not learning more vocabulary. It's not like you're, you're missing some words. And if you learn those words, then you can speak. That's not what's happening. What's really happening is you don't know the language as well as you think you do. And so people think something is easy when they know it, but being able to speak fluently is a different thing. And you need to develop that automatic habit of communication, which is why we practice these things, all right? The good news is you don't need a speaking practice partner to do this with, you just need to get lots of input, all right? So this is the kind of thing uh, we do in Fluent for Life, but you can obviously do it by yourself if you like. All right, let's see anybody else over here. Yes, university level. Yeah, so I would focus on that. So which language does your wife speak? Uh, my wife is uh, native Japanese, uh, and her English is really good too, but she spends more time uh, speaking to the kids in Japanese, and obviously my children go to uh, Japanese school. In order to write effectively, it is essential to read extensively. Yes, it's also helpful. Hey, bro, I love you, and thanks so much for all. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I can understand English. Hey, Drew, hello from Brazil. I do not speak proper way. Yes, well, you got to get more examples of native speech, which is what we talk about in these videos. All right, uh, Armando says, I'm from Argentina, and my girlfriend, she's from China. English is a communication bridge between us. Was it the same story for you and your wife? Yeah, Mike, her, my Japanese improved over time. So I didn't know any Japanese when I came to Japan and I had to learn it. Uh, but when I met my wife, her English was at a higher level than my Japanese. I think probably my Japanese might be better than her, her English now. <laughs> so she knows more, more words, but I, I like review the language in a different way. So I'm, I have uh, like, a, like a higher degree of fluency and I have more, more confidence. Uh, to be able to go out and speak with more people. Oh, and Nils is back. Hopefully you watched Die Hard uh, since we last spoke. All right, next, I want to get uh, keep moving over here. Make sure we don't get stuck for too long. How are we going? 12 minutes so far. All right, so remember, focus on subject verb agreement. And I know it might seem boring if you already know something already, but remember, you don't really know it. You don't really know it uh, until you can use it fluently, all right? That's the real test. It's not whether you can like pass a written exam or something. We want to really know something, and that's when you know you can use it fluently. All right, so the second thing I work on with my daughters is exceptions, exceptions. So we started number one with basic things about the language, especially subject verb agreement, because this is so important for English and especially for my daughters because they don't have that in Japanese. Uh, but I want to have them focus on exceptions. So one of these would be like irregular verbs, irregular verbs. All right. So this is again, I gave the example before about I go, uh, but then I went. Anytime you have uh, something that's easy to understand, like I played, I talked, I listened, anything that just ends in an ED like that, anything like that, it's going to be nice and easy to remember, so you don't need to spend much time on it. So you need to spend more time on the exceptions, okay? So the, the, the things that break the rules. Because when little kids learn the language, the first thing they try to say is, I go. So I go to the park. I go to the park. Now, logically, this makes sense. There's no reason why we should make it went. Why do we make a completely different word? I don't want to get into the history of anything like that because I don't teach that to my kids. But the point is we have to correct them and spend more time with these things. All right. So I went to the park. I went to the park. So we focus on a lot of exceptions uh, and especially things like uh, like singular and plural. So if we have like one foot, 
and I'll give them little quizzes like this. Like, okay, I've got one foot. This is another exception where we're doing something like, you know, one hand becomes two hands. So two hands. But one foot is two feet. Okay? Again, the things that are different are the things you should focus on because your mind, once your mind gets the pattern, you really only need three examples to get a pattern. Okay? So you get like your first one, like I, let's say we got play and we have talk and we have, uh, let's see, I don't know, uh, listen. So the past tense of all these, when we're just saying, oh, like, what did you do yesterday? Oh, I played, I talked, I listened, okay? So as you get these, most of the language will be the normal thing, and you start developing the pattern recognition for this, and that's what will help you speak. But when you experience something new, your brain kind of goes like, ah, what do we, ah, what happened here? One foot, two feet, one mouse, Two mice. One mouse, two mice. Put these up here too. Okay. Now remember, even if you know all of these examples, this is not about you knowing the language. It's can you use the language fluently or not. All right. And so when we have these examples, you should be able to automatically count like one mouse, two mice without saying anything. Okay. Without even thinking about it. Same thing. One foot, two feet, two feet. So we focus on the exceptions, and I spend a lot of time with my kids giving them examples of things like this, like I just, like, just talked about. So we talked a lot about, like, what did you do yesterday? Where did you go? Like, oh, we went here. What did you do there? Well, we did this and we did that. So we, we practice a lot of these things, okay? They don't realize it's practice, but I'm just giving them lots of input. And even if they're not speaking, I'm the one saying a lot of things to them, and that's how they become good speakers because they're listening to my examples. And, and also, this is not just me. Like they're, they're also getting you know, like other examples from like their mother or you know, other, other people in their life or TV, other things like that. But it's my job really to, to give them lots of specific input so I can really help them understand these things, all right? So I recommend, again, these are the same kinds of things that I see learners making mistakes with. So remember, if you can understand this, but you can't use it fluently, spend more time on this stuff, all right? I promise you, if you listen to a lot more examples, if you listen to a hundred examples of, oh, okay, he went. She went, they went, ah, you, you will feel very confident about that. And it doesn't matter what the verb is, it could be run. So that's another one. We don't say run. Run, run, run. It actually be like ruined if this is ran. So yesterday my kids ran at the park. They ran at the park, all right? So this is another example we would spend more time on, all right? If you have any questions about that, let me know before we move on to number three. All right, hopefully we're moving along here, 18 minutes so far. I'll see if anybody had any questions. All right, let's see. All right, my nation is an Iranian, my son, uh, English native speaker. Well, that's nice. Please suggest something, method, book, video, anything. If you've been conducting any writing skills improvement program, let me know. Well, there, again, I'm, I'm sure other people already have made some kind of thing, but the most basic thing is read essays and, and physically write them by hand. Copy what they do. Uh, and you can do this with uh, shorter things, especially if it's a college essay and maybe two pages of something. Spend time looking at how people write. And you can also, uh, I'm not really very specific or, or getting specific information about what the problem is if you don't understand the structure or your writing, like your English is just not good enough for that. I don't know. Uh, you can let me know. But if you, if you copy, if you read what other people are doing and then actually copy by hand with the paper and pen, then you will start uh, improving and learning to write better. All right, just fun. I am a law faculty student, and my all lesson in, in my all all lesson English. So all of your lessons are in English. All of your lessons are in English. Notice how I how I go through some of these comments and and rephrase, so to to help people uh, kind of correct these things and try to help them think about it more like a native. So you can say my classes are all in English. Uh, and my English level is not enough for my lessons. Do you have any suggestion for me? You have to spend more time learning like a native, getting more examples, 
All right. If you look at my channel, uh, look at some of my more popular videos recently. Uh, the live videos I've done, like the like three levels of fluency, um, or if you only have 15 minutes, do this. Uh, so these are the different things that I focus on. But it's really just one. It's really one lesson that I repeat again and again in different ways, and that's how to learn like a native English speaker, so you understand English like a native, and that's when you speak. All right, the, the, main, the main like core idea of what I do for everything, all of the videos, all of my programs, is that you don't become fluent by repeating things over and over again. You get fluent by understanding the language like a native, and it's for any language, all right? So I'm trying to learn Japanese in the same way, and that's how I become fluent. I learn things like, oh, look at that, I just understood something new like a native, and now I can use it like a native rather than trying to trying to take vocabulary and repeat it. So I can spend my time trying to repeat things or I can spend my time getting many more examples. So I just call this understandable messages. Uh, it's also known as comprehensible input, but it just means you're getting a lot more examples of the language and that's what's going to help you speak. So the more examples you get, the faster you get fluent. Really, uh, if you don't feel confident about the language you know, then you're not going to feel confident about speaking, right? So you need to have a good, solid understanding of the language, and then you become a much more confident speaker. All right, let's see if we have anything else over here. Uh, let's see. Oh, it looks like we had a couple more. Uh, R says, sir, how to make complex sentences while speaking. I just made a video about that. Check my YouTube channel about that. Uh, thank you, Jose says, for sharing your knowledge. A lot of help. Brazilian living in Australia. Thanks. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened either. <laughs> I watched, but I don't know it. <laughs> All right, Nils. All right. Well, give it a try. But hopefully you saw that one line. Nils is dead. Nils is dead. Oh, no. Yeah, it's, a, it's a funny movie. All right, Richard Bet. Hi, Drew from Columbia in the house. Let's see, says Richard. Finally caught you live watching from South Africa. Look at that, people all over the place. Tim Paul in uh, India over there. Hi from Uzbekistan. My son is an English native speaker. I don't know how it happened, and now I need to learn English. Well, ask him to teach you. <laughs> it, probably how it happened is the same way it's happening for my kids, where you're getting exposure to lots of, of, lots of English. All right? And if you can understand that, you will learn to speak fluently because fluency comes from understanding the language well. It doesn't come from just reading textbooks and practicing vocabulary like that. Uh, Yo uses, what does living the dream mean? So usually if you think about what a dream is, a dream is a fantastic uh, like ideal state or mind like it's like wow I'm getting I get to travel the world and uh, you know I'm like I can just imagine that eat whatever I want to and I don't get fat and you know all, whatever the, the dream happens to be but if you're actually doing that thing you are living the dream so you can look at someone like wow it's a professional athlete and I don't know maybe they they get lots of money and they can travel around and do lots of things that person is living the dream living the dream so it says, what about people who say learning English the EFL way is just learning how to use vocabulary in different contexts? For example, I caught the ball and I caught the live act. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, it's just understanding the language like a native. You might call it something else. I, I don't know what else you could call it. I call it learning English as a first language because you're not learning it through another language. It's learning it through your native language that makes it more difficult for you to understand. The, like the whole reason people use translations is because they don't understand what they're saying. And so if you learn the language that way, you are teaching yourself to translate and that's what makes it more difficult to speak. All right. So if you learn the language in the language, and that means like for me learning Japanese in Japanese or for you learning English in English, whatever language it is, then that's what's going to help you speak. All right. So you don't want to spend time uh, like reviewing grammar tables or translations that are going to stop you from speaking. But you should be understanding things, and the more examples you get, the, the broader and deeper your understanding becomes. 
Uh, Isaac says, do we need to spend time learning those exceptions? What's the best tech to, technique to learn exceptions? The, the problem with exceptions is the only way to do it is really just to get lots of examples of it. So you did because your, your, your brain is a pattern recognizing machine. Your brain is like, look, it's like square circle, square circle, square circle. And then you get triangle in there and then, whoa, your brain is like, ah, what happened? So you just have to spend more time practicing these things. And I mean, as far as like spe specific tips go, there, there really aren't many things that you need to do for that. There aren't a lot of irregular verbs that you use in everyday life. Most of the things, the reason we call it an irregular verb is because the, the regular verbs are more normal. <laughs> like that's the, that's the regular thing. So think about the, the specific errors that you might make and I would focus on those. So if you're if you're if you know how to use go and went, then you don't need to review that anymore. But if there are other words that you do use, but you notice you don't use them correctly, I would spend more time on that. Miguel, hi, you are awesome. I'm learning a lot with your lessons. Glad to hear it. Uh, Cam from Thailand. I strongly believe that reading books is the most effective approach to mastering grammar. Yeah, it's certainly a good way to do that. Uh, but remember that in real conversations, you have to be prepared for how other people speak. And so I could read a book and I could continue to read books and I could actually become like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really call it fluent for conversations, but I could certainly become a fluent reader of the language, but it would be much more difficult for me to then go to a party and then if I'm not really hearing lots of other people and I'm not prepared for people who have different accents or people who are using vocabulary differently or slang and idioms, that kind of thing, that part of the language is much more difficult to learn by reading. So you really need to get lots of naturally varied input in different ways. So this is why I have reading and writing and watching videos and listening to things. All of these examples get you fluent. Uh, let's see. So how good to speak with other? Yeah, it's, it's not as like the, the, the final communication with other people is a very small piece of the, the learning that you should be doing by yourself. If you actually are learning and you understand the language very well, you will feel more confident when you do speak. All right. So speaking is the, the, the final thing that you do after you understand. I can't avoid translation while uh, listening or reading, says Miguel. Well, the way to avoid this is to, is to go back to something that's at your level. So you should understand at least 80 to 90% of what you're learning. So whatever that is, if I'm watching a movie and I don't understand most of it, I'm watching a movie that's too difficult for me. I can certainly push myself and try to try to watch it, but it's not going to be very enjoyable. So I should I should dial it back. There's a good phrasal a phrasal verb for it to dial it back. I'm like turning it down a little bit. Dial it back. Dial it back. Whoops. There we go. Dial it. Dial it back. So remember a dial, like you're turning something down like that, all right? This is the same way I would teach my kids, all right? We'll talk about that in just a moment as well. So to dial something back, uh, I really want to help people understand things. And so if you, like in, like in my videos that I make, I'm using English, but I'm not, I'm not using a lot of complex idioms or references for movies other than something for Nils about Die Hard. <laughs> but in general, I'm, I'm, I'm being very, uh, very strategic about how I how I teach you and this is why people say wow Drew I really understand your English very easily so I'm being very clear and I'm helping people understand without using a lot of complicated vocabulary so you really have to introduce those things in steps as you learn all right let's see what else we got here before we move on Salima is back learn with learn English your ears not your eyes I don't know why people give that advice learn English with your ears, not your eyes. And it doesn't make sense to me that you would learn with your ears and not with your eyes because children don't learn a language that way. So you don't, you don't have a child. Like I don't take my own daughters and put a blindfold over their eyes so they can't see what I'm talking about. Language is about triangulation, where we want to use as many senses as possible to understand something. Like if we have, uh, if I'm trying to taste some ice cream, I could explain to you what vanilla tastes like. I could try to explain that. It's like, okay, let's learn about vanilla with our ears, 
not our taste buds. That doesn't make any sense. So you should be learning about that. I want to learn the color, how it sounds, if there's like a sound to the ice cream or whatever. Uh, but that's what's going to help you speak. So don't, don't, I, I would not listen to any advice that people are saying you only should listen to something when like, of course, you should be seeing it and really understanding what the thing is. The goal is understanding that however it works. So I might like taste the ice cream and that's going to be the fastest way to understand what an ice cream flavor is rather than hearing a bunch of people talking about it. All right. So it depends on the case. Uh, let's see. Thank you for your response. It makes so much sense. I teach English online and I'll be buying the Fluence for Life course. You've completely changed my mind about teaching English. Glad to hear it. I look forward to welcoming you to the program. If you have any questions, let us know. Uh, let's see. Hi, teacher. You are uh, very good explaining. Glad to hear it. Give me a hello, please. Hello, Gio Carlos from Brazil. Nils is laughing over there. Ronnie again. What do you think is more influential for an adult to learn a new language? What is more influential? Hmm, I don't know what you mean by that. Influential about what? You might say the most important thing is to get lots of native input that you can understand. That's really the basis of how you get fluent. All right. Uh, let's see. I've watched all your lives. I've started uh, teaching some of my students the EFL way and the progress has been remarkable. So many aha moments. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm pronouncing that right, is it Slee? That's an interesting name. Um, yeah. And, and so it, like people think it's like, wow, it's such an amazing thing. But this is how they're using the native language that they use every day. So all I'm doing is making you learn English or helping you learn English like a native speaker. So that's what we're talking about in this video. These are the things I do with my own kids. All right, uh, let's see. I don't only learn my ears, but that's popular advice, I guess. Yeah, so I, I don't know why that's popular, but uh, yeah, I, I've heard that before. Julian, I have adopted a highly effective strategy to enhance my English language skills. It involves engaging with English language videos on YouTube that depict the rituals of my religion. Yep, again, you're, you're focusing on, on something interesting and getting lots of, uh, lots of examples of it. That's, it's naturally a varied review. Mihak says, good morning, sir. Greetings from India. I have a question in my mind since you have been telling us about Naturally Varied Review and how do you get it? I mean, how could I practice it? So Naturally Varied Review means that you're getting lots of different examples in different ways and that's what's going to, it, it basically simulates how you're learning in, in a real, real life situation. So going back to my own kids, I will tell my daughters, hey, wash your hands. My wife will also tell my daughters or our daughters, like, wash your hands, all right? So they're saying the same thing, um, and, and, and they're hearing that from different people. They might watch a TV show, and the, the characters are washing their hands. And so they hear that same English from different people. They're getting used to the grammar, the pronunciation, different ways of, of, of people communicating. So some people might be clearer or less clear. All right, so this is why we get naturally varied review, but there are different ways of doing that. So number one, I could take something like, like a piece of content, like this video that you're watching right now. So after this is finished, if they're like a transcript will be available, I don't know, maybe in two days or something, uh, but you can go back and review you just reading the transcript after you watch the video or you could take a movie and do the same thing so you watch the movie and then just listen to it all right so your ears will become more sensitive I recommend you watch the video first then without watching it just listen to the video you know put on the the movie or something while you're doing dishes or you know cleaning your house or whatever driving just so you can listen to that all right and then read the transcript of that thing so read the, the, the script of that movie. And then watch some people talking about that movie on YouTube. There are lots of people, especially content uh, that's popular, you will have many videos talking about that thing. So any popular TV show, you will find people talking about specific episodes and this happened and that happened. And the, the, the deeper you go into the language, the more fluent you become. Okay, so that's how we get, these are different examples of naturally varied review, but it's just the, the, the most basic idea is that most learners, they will get one example of something, like one translation. I learn a word like go, and then I learn a word in Japanese like iku. 
okay? So I'm going to think like, okay, go just means iku, but like maybe that means something different in a different context, all right? So that's why we spend more time getting lots of this input. So it's much better to be very, very good at using 10 words rather than know 100 words and not be able to use them fluently, okay? All right, now I'm getting, getting behind over here. I'm already at 34 minutes. Let's see here. All right, uh, it's pronounced asleep without the P. Ah, okay, oh, excellent, excellent uh, explanation. Very good, thank you. All right, uh, how do native speakers design, let's see, how do native speakers decide on, decide on which grammatical structures they would use when they want to express an idea? Uh, Kent, uh, this is an idea I call moving with, uh, or moving like water, where natives are, they basically have a few different ways of expressing something, and then maybe they just naturally pick one in the moment that, without thinking about it, and you do this by getting naturally varied review. So I might have a, I might want to say, let's say I say X, some something I have an idea to say whatever uh, I might express that in a few different ways as an example uh, here in Japan uh, I've seen on like written on toilets some of the toilets are automatic flushing toilets and the, like these are different like different toilets made by different companies and they each have a note on there that says this toilet will automatically flush but I notice that they're not written the exact same way. So some of them it's like, or something like that. And so it will, it will say like, like, even if there's nobody there, the, the water will still flush. But it will express that in slightly different ways. And the reason that is, is because there are different ways to express that. All right? So it's like if you're, like you're walking, like walking this way, this way, that way, that way, I want to get here, but I could take a, like a different, different route and get to the same place. So natives, natives learn these different ways of doing something, but mostly uh, non-natives, when they're learning, the, learning English or whatever the language, they will focus on a particular way of doing that, a particular translation. And then when they forget that translation, then they think, ah, like, now I can't speak. I forgot the one word that I needed to say. But natives don't care because there are different ways I could say that. Even if I forget something basic, I had a, like a discussion with a guy. Uh, I was giving him an example of this and I was saying, oh, I can't remember the word cat as an example. So I'm in a conversation it's like, yeah, my friend has a pet. And I can't just say my friend has a cat. I would say, oh, my friend has a, has a pet. You know, it's like a small thing. You know, it's about this big, it's got a, like a long tail, it lives in the house. It's not a dog. And I'm, I'm talking, I'm explaining all of this just as an example. Like I know what a cat is, but I'm explaining this just showing that it's another way of talking about what a cat is. <laughs> so I can, I can describe a cat or I could even draw a picture. It's like, yeah, you know, what, what's the name of that animal where, you know, it's got like a face like this and kind of some pointy ears and they, they live in the house. They don't really go out. You don't walk them like a dog, you know, has uh, some whiskers and a little nose and a mouth. Like, what's the name of that animal? And the other person says, ah, it's a cat. And I think, ah, okay. So what happens, a native speaker will do that. They will find a different way to explain something because there's usually not just one way to do that. I actually, I covered this specific idea in a recent live video, uh, what was that? Where I was talking about like native, it might've been strategies for, for continuing to speak, for like maintaining fluent con communication or fluent conversations. So go watch that video, it will explain more about that. All right. Uh, let's see, uh, Richard again, I'm so grateful about Drew because I reach fluency I want and I make, uh, and make me feel confident about my speaking. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. So remember, even when people are feeling confident, I'm always trying to get people to a higher level. So right there, like there's a lot of good English in that sentence, in that comment, but it still had an example of, uh, a, like an incorrect use of subject verb agreement. All right, so you can still have like, and it make me feel confident. Now it might be a typo, which is fine, but remember like it makes me feel confident. It's still the same basic idea of subject verb agreement, but that's why we review these things. So it makes me feel, she makes me feel happy. It makes me feel good, all right? I make her feel good. 
All right, so I make her, so her make. We're changing the order of this, but it's still that basic subject verb agreement. This is why I practice this so much with my own kids. Uh, how many times should I review naturally to reach that level of fluency? Uh, Isaac, it just depends on what the thing is, and sometimes you can get an example of something and you understand it like that. So it can be a very quick thing. It's, the point is just to understand something until you, you should feel it. It's like an aha moment in your mind where you're like, ah, now I got it. Now I got it, all right? So it might be one time, it might be many times, okay? Uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example of that that I've, I've done before. So if I'm trying to teach you a new word, and if I just have a flashcard, something, what, what will I do today? Uh, let's see. I'm, so I'm thinking of a word. Let's see if I can communicate that word to you. All right, this word is, uh, we'll just call this goo. This is not an English word. This is just an example of something, all right? If I give you this picture and say this word, do you understand what I'm talking about? Maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't. You might have an idea. You might be thinking, oh, that's a fish. Could be something else. So I give you another example. Let's see, we're gonna use the example we just, uh, just gave over here. Goop. So now your brain is getting a little bit more aligned. It's like, ah, okay, goo, goo. So now my, my brain is trying to think, what is the common thing between these two examples? Maybe I do another one. Goo. All right, so we're getting closer. You can probably imagine I mean something like animal, okay? And so as I give you more examples of something, that's when you really feel confident about the vocabulary. And often you need a few examples because your, your mind is trying to, it's like, it's like triangulation, to triangulate something, like just like a regular triangle. So you can test this for yourself. If you cover one of your eyes and try to look at something, you can see generally where it is, but you can't tell how far away it is. That's why we have two eyes. So we can see that thing clearly and our eyes are like, they're not, we don't have two eyes in the same place. They're, they're here and here to make a triangle. So we can see something easily. And it's the same thing. You're making like a triangle in your mind. And the more examples of that thing you get, the broader perspective or the, the better your understanding becomes. All right. Hopefully this makes sense. So teachers have to think, they have to have a lot of empathy. They really need to be imagining what it's like to be a, a student. So when I'm doing videos or talking about things, I have to imagine you as a learner out there and thinking, does this person understand what I'm talking about? And sometimes like people won't say they don't understand. And often people can go through whole years of school and like the student didn't actually understand something. All right. But this is how it works. So it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a different thing for each um, for each example. So some vocabulary might be easier, some vocabulary is not, and also it depends on the teacher and how, how good they are at, at explaining something. Uh, let's see, okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So am I living in Japan? Uh, ueno? Looks like, whoa, Nihonjin kana? Yes, I'm living in Japan. Nagasaki ni uh, I follow, let's see, I focus, says Salima, I focus the language for a few weeks and I feel improvements, but I am uh, like the learned and lost. I have a problem, procrastination. Ah, well, find something you're interested in then. See, most people are, are not, they don't procrastinate about the thing that they really want to do. Maybe you really love a book or whatever. I'll, I'll tell you something I recently got uh, tears of the kingdom. <laughs> and so I'm always like excited, like, oh yeah, I want to go play, play the game. I don't know if anybody else here has that game. So this was, it's the new Zelda game that was just released, I think a week and a half ago. Um, but so like, I, I'm never procrastinating about that. All right. So that's just one example. But if I'm procrastinating about something else, it means I, I should figure out a better way to do that thing. All right, so for learning English, if you have a textbook that you're learning and you don't like that and you're, you're not interested in that, then of course you will procrastinate. But if you can watch videos about something you're interested in, like I could watch videos about Zelda in Japanese, and I'm learning Japanese and learning more about the thing I'm interested in at the same time. All right, so make it interesting for yourself. 
so Slee says, by the way, why can't we watch any ads on your channel? There are so many gems here. Uh, is it not monetized yet? Uh, Slee, I, I, I turned off all the ads many years ago because I don't want to interrupt people watching my video. <laughs> So I I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know if that like, if that hurts me financially or not. The, the people I can help like usually join Fluent for Life or other programs I have, and those are the people that support me financially. Uh, but I don't like putting ads in front of my videos, and I think it's a, it's a waste of time for you to come here and, and do that. So I'm happy to to not get that. So if you're not a member of my program and you'd like to support me, feel free. I don't ask for donations or anything, but the point of YouTube is really to show people how to learn, and then I, I, for, I take people through that process in programs for people that would like help. All right. Uh, are those videos that claim to enable learning English while sleeping actually fraudulent? I don't know. I've never tried that before. I suppose like you could you could kind of learn more maybe while you're falling asleep, but I, I don't know if any 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 of that is if any of that is is true. I have no idea. Give it a try. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't offer anything like that because that's not how I get fluent. But who knows? Uh, Demi says, I have tried several times to learn Japanese, but remember, hiragana and katakana are so hard. Maybe you have some recommendations for memorizing the alphabets. Um, well, I'll give you, I can give you a very quick lesson about that. Depending on what your native language is, um, reading and writing are, are like the one thing that I do say it's okay to use your, your translation or, or some kind of like a, like a mnemonic. So a mnemonic, I'll write that for you. I have to clean this up. Oh no, we're only on number two and we've been going for 45 minutes. You guys have a lot of good questions though. All right, mnemonic. All right, so it, it starts with an M here. There's a silent M at the front of that. A mnemonic, so we pronounce this with an M, mnemonic. This is a memory aid, memory aid. As an example, uh, in Japan, uh, the word for meat is niku. So I might write it in Japanese like that, niku, or I might write it in like uh, Japanese characters like that, niku. Uh, and so the word like ni is also two and ku is 29. So on some months where we have uh, like a 29th day, we, we don't have that in February, but we do have that uh, like the 29th day of the month in some restaurants, they have the meat at a lower price. So if you go to a lower price, you can go to niku, it's like meat day, all right? So this is a mnemonic to help you remember that, all right? So I do recommend uh, using mnemonics for reading and writing. So especially if I'm trying to learn something like a, a written character, uh, it's okay to use mnemonics because I have time to think when I read and write. I don't want to use mnemonics when I'm speaking because I don't have time to think. I need to just respond to people automatically. So mnemonics are okay for this. And so as an example, like native English speakers uh, typically learn Japanese through mnemonics like this. So I'll just teach you some characters very quickly. Uh, like as an example, like this is the hiragana for no, uh, but it looks kind of like, like a no parking sign or like, you know, don't do that kind of thing. And so you're learning the shape of that thing along with the sound of it. So I could just say like, okay, I want you to repeat this again and again and again, and you will probably not remember that. But with one example and a good mnemonic, I can help you remember that very quickly. Or you might have another character like she. And so I could make a little face on there and it's like a lady, like she has long hair. She has long hair, all right? And so here, again, I have time to think and, and I, can, I can do that while I'm writing because I have time while I'm writing. All right, so it's okay to use that kind of thing. So I don't know what your native language is, but if you're learning Japanese, that would be a very quick way to do that. Uh, and then when you're learning things like this, the characters, you, you really get good at this by telling stories with the characters as well. So these are the kinds of things that you can do when you're reading and writing that you don't do when you're speaking, all right? So I, I don't recommend mnemonics for learning speech. You should be doing that all in, uh, all in English. All right, uh, let's see. So, all right, next, Ken is back. Uh, I have gotten close to that water-like thing. I think 
but at times I still find my head goes fuzzy and I'm unable to keep my grammar right or be decisive about choosing one. Yeah, I, I think you're still you're still overly conscious about it. You're you're probably thinking about grammar because you've studied grammar for a long time. So natives don't even know the names of grammar points. They're just thinking about what do you say in this situation. All right. So a perfect example. Uh, so my younger daughter Noel, she was watching a cartoon and all of the characters, like they said hooray when they did something well. And so like later that day. Noelle did something well and she said, hooray, <laughs> like she just, she saw in this situation when you're excited about something, then you see, ah, okay, they say these words, all right? So that's how like typically people are learning the language that way. So don't think about the grammar, just think about what are the kinds of things people say in that situation. And remember that uh, you can see many examples of something uh, or, or native speakers might express many different ways of saying something. You might say, like, let's say, uh, yesterday I went to uh, my friend's house to do something. You could also say, yesterday I was over at my friend's house. So I don't even use the word, I don't even use a verb at all. All right. Well, I, I guess you could say I was over at, like, my, I was at my friend's house. But I'm not using go. All right. So I went to my friend's house uh, or I was over at my friend's house. There are different ways of expressing the same thing. And so natives, I give the spelling example all the time because natives make a lot of errors in spelling. It's just part of how the language is difficult. Uh, but people make errors with spelling and a native will be writing something and they will think, oh, I don't remember how to spell that. So they will use a different word. <laughs> so like if I if I'm if I'm writing uh, something like like, I, I watched a movie, it was hilarious, hilarious. And I'm trying to write, it's like, hilarious. It was funny. <laughs> it was a funny movie, okay? So these are the kinds of things, like, it, it might not be perfectly exactly what you want to say, but it doesn't matter. Nobody, for most conversations, it's not really that important. Uh, all right, hopefully that makes sense though. All right, uh, so, all right, all right. Uh, LA says, how many years did it take you to be fluent in Japanese? So this is a, an interesting question uh, with an interesting answer. So as I explained to people, you get fluent in individual words and phrases. So you become fluent, like I learn how to use a word like go and I become fluent in that word. And then I learn other words and I become fluent in using those things as well. So it's not like it took me many years to get fluent. I just got fluent in things over time, like different things. But each one of those, if you become fluent in each one of these things, then your, your fluency improves uh, much faster. But I can learn something like a better example is like learning vocabulary for when my wife was pregnant. So my wife became pregnant. I didn't know a lot of that vocabulary for, you know, having kids or going to the, like the, the, I don't know, the, the women's clinic or whatever. So I had to learn that vocabulary, but I could get fluent in that very quickly because I just started getting lots of examples of that. So it's not like it took me three years to become fluent about like the whole language, but I'm getting fluent in the particular things uh, as, I, as I need them for my life. It's like just in time learning or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it took me like for the first year I was in Japan, I, I didn't really improve much at all because I was still learning the traditional way. But once I started changing the way I learned, I noticed I was becoming fluent much faster and that was in individual words and phrases as I understood them. And even now I will learn new uses of things that are words I learned, you know, 20 years ago or something or not that long ago, but yeah, almost. Wow. In uh, actually in like three months, it will be 20 years. So I came to Japan 20 years ago. Uh, let's see here. All right. All right. So Slee says, is the EFL way still applicable to beginners who don't even know a single word of English apart from high? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, watch the, uh, the video series I have on YouTube about 
uh, best beginning English grammar playlist. So it's even it's it's actually most important for the beginning learner. So you need to make the language understandable for them. Otherwise, the language is boring and frustrating, and you you like start them learning off on a on a really like basically a horrible way. Um, and that's why people often are they don't like learning languages. Everybody wants to speak, but nobody wants to learn. <laughs> It's like people want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die, you know, same kind of thing. But language learning actually should be very easy if you're making it easier for people to learn. All right, uh, Bayro says, how long does it take to speak fluently in general topics? Currently intermediate uh, level one, I suppose. I'm at IBT 80 or IELTS 6. It depends on the topic and what your, what your actual fluent level is. So not just the vocabulary you know, but if you, if you feel confident, what we do in Fluent for Life is we get people fluent in uh, particular topics in 30 days or less, and then you move on to the next topic. But then you can also use the vocabulary and the fluency you built for this topic to talk about something else. So natives are talking about, it could be dating and relationships or whatever, but we use that same vocabulary when talking about business or war or sports or anything like that. So the trick is to get fluent in the vocabulary, which you can then use in, in many other things. So I have a whole video about this. It's like, uh, what did I call that? Um, it's like one, like one, one thing to do. It might have been the 15 minutes one. Like if you only have 15 minutes to learn, do this, I think. I forget. Uh, but it was, no, I think it was how to speak fluently about almost anything. So it's the same idea. Uh, all right, so Rich says, thanks, Drew Nils says, love your example, glad to hear it. I intuitively learn the language as a discoverer. Yep, that's, that's the name of the game right there, to discover it. All my life I studied only through a strong passion for something. Greetings to all from Russian. Uh, I wish peace on the entire planet as soon as probably possible. Uh, oh, oh, okay, glad to hear it. Uh, so I appreciate your, appreciate your teaching, says Izaki. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Sarvanaz. Love your English. Uh, I love English very much. Glad to hear. Hi there. What's up? Just arrived. So Frederick is amazing. My students love it. It's really amazing because it allows them to fiddle with the language. Yep, that's it exactly. So they learn pronunciation in a fun way. So the, the thing that's fun for language learning is when you get to discover what something means by yourself. So if I just tell you the meaning of everything, then like it's, it's like if you watch a TV show and they tell you what the answer is. That's not fun. The point is the discovery of it. And so that's why you should be trying to make, make, make the discovery as easy as possible for learners. Also learn the word zap. Yeah. So again, it's like it's there. There are actually a lot of people think Frederick is for beginners, but it's actually for for anybody trying to learn the language and wants to understand it. And there are many advanced words that are even short, like zap, or vat, or let's see, what are some other short ones like jut? That's another one that a lot of people don't know, but it's it's all explained in Frederick. Uh, which I didn't know, but completely forgot it because I was so used to using shock. Yep, and again, it's another, uh, another thing that you can learn. So if you're using that with students, if you have paid for the whole app, you can go to the unlock button on the title screen. If you click that, then it will take you to a little section, just a screen where you can hold down, I think the red square and the blue square. And if you shake your device, it will unlock all the levels and modes for you. So some students want to start at a higher level if they already know easier things. Uh, Antonio says, do you think listening is the best thing to do? No, it's not listening or watching or whatever. It's just understanding. And however that is possible, do that thing. So like I gave the example earlier about trying some food. I don't want to listen to the food if I'm trying to understand what, what pizza tastes like. I don't listen to that. I want to try it. I want to taste that thing. All right. So the goal is understanding. We want to get that uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, let's see. All right, here we go. Hi there again. I try to be courageous, XXX brave. Yes, remember that you don't need to be brave in order to learn a language. It's just about being understandable. So I don't actually recommend people get out and try to speak. You can, but if you don't feel comfortable and confident, then it's because you don't know the language as well as you think you do. So spend more time getting more examples and then you will feel confident. You don't have to be brave, just like you're not really brave in your native language. You're just using the language. All right. 
uh, is fluent instantly or it takes time. Uh, so it's not, again, like you, could, it's, you, you get fluent in individual words and phrases as you understand them. So I might know one word but not know another word. And I can get fluent in that word instantly if I understand it instantly. Like if I hold up a bunch of markers and it's like, if I'm teaching you some Japanese and I want to help you understand that, I would still need to have uh, some review of that, but it's like maka, 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 kudo, kudoi, kudo, kudo, kudoi maka, au, aoi maka, aka, akai maka. And if you heard me review that again and again, you would start to get it. But without me giving you translations, you're like, ah, aka, 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 akai maka, au, aoi, aoi maka, kudo, kudoi maka, kudoi maka. All right. So when you're hearing uh, different examples of these things, that's what helps you get fun. All right. And Julian says, I find myself in a situation where I'm conversing in English with someone and I happen to forget a word. What do you recommend? Use something else. Use a different word. So you, you have like, a, I can tell you are an intelligent person and you have like, you're like the, the same comments uh, you're, you're saying like you, you have like a very thoughtful and, and kind of longer way of expressing something, but natives can, again, have different ways of speaking. So just let, let me reread your comment and express your own comment in a different way. So Julian says, if I find myself in a situation where I'm conversing in English with someone, all right, so there's a lot like you could eliminate a lot of the, the vocabulary from that, from that, uh, like even that, just that clause of that, and then we're not even through the full the full sentence yet. So if I find myself in a situation where I'm conversing in English with someone, so like conversing implies someone else. So we don't even need to put that like the, the additional person in there. Uh, and I happen to forget a word, what should I, uh, what do you recommend I do? So an even simpler way is just like, what should I do when I forget a word in conversations? What should I do? So we wanted, we were looking for advice. What should I do? if I forget a word in conversations. Okay, so what's the, I'm looking for advice, here's the situation, and, and what's the answer to that, all right? So just like I, I, I changed the same thing, I expressed the same thing in a different way, and this is what you learn to do as you get naturally varied review. So you hear different examples, you hear different natives talking about something, just like I showed in the, uh, the espresso video that I have on the channel. So watch that video if you've not seen that already, but this, for, for any new people, this is where I give examples of different people making espresso. So you have four different people making espresso and talking about it in slightly different ways. And so you will notice some of the vocabulary is the same, some of it is different, and you can hear how different people express things differently. So it's important not to be focused on a specific word or grammar point you want to, look, want to use in a situation. You should be thinking, this is what I want to express, and actually there are many ways to do that. So I can relax and let the easiest one flow out. So this is moving like water. Uh, let's see, is, uh, let's see that one here. I'm from Tajikistan. Love your pronunciation and a textile. Or maybe teach, you mean. Drew, what about students who are learning English for job interviews? Well, I would again, like, it depends on uh, like what their level of English is already, but they're different. I don't know. They, they, this, they, like, talking specifically about in, interview English or whatever, that's beyond the scope of this video. But it, the same principles would apply. I would watch people, I would watch like 10 different people in an interview. Same thing. So saying like, okay, how do, how do 10 different people respond to that same question? And you can see how that works. But at a deeper level, I would actually recommend people like, if I'm trying to get a job at a company, I don't wait for a job interview. I would try to contact like the person higher up <laughs> and see if I can, if I can speak with them and, and say, hey, your company has this problem and here's how I can solve it for you. And most people would be happy to hire you if that's true. Uh, I love your pronunciation. Okay, I had that one already. Hi, I'm Rocky from Windsor, Ontario in Canada. Pleased to meet you. Nice to see you there. So how do they go about practicing English? Do they focus on memorizing answers and focus on? No, no, no. The, the point is not to memorize answers. I mean, you, you basically learn kind of trends or patterns that people would use. So if I say good morning, then usually people will say good morning back to me. That's the kind of typical thing. But you might hear other things. Someone might say, well, uh, good afternoon, good day. 
how are you? They might respond back in a different way. And so as you get more examples of that, uh, that's when you start like developing that native sense for how to how to respond to people. Konnichiwa, Drew. I just wanted to tell you that I love Frederick. Glad to hear, Elena. If you know other people who would like to play Frederick and uh, improve their pronunciation, you can click on the link uh, in the description right here in this video. I tried several ways to keep up improved general English, but failed. Any advice? Says Barus. Barus. Uh, yes. Follow what I'm telling you to do in these videos. <laughs> so my advice is to understand English like a native, so you speak like a native. It's really that simple, all right? So this is what we do in Fluent for Life, but you will get lots of examples of this uh, through the, the various videos I have on YouTube. Uh, let's see, good evening, teacher. I'm from Peru. Uh, I don't know if you remember me. Oh, yes, uh, the, one of my Peruvian students, yes. <laughs> Yes, we need the whole University of Peru watching these videos. All right, Brittany says, what did I miss? <laughs> Go back and watch the, uh, watch the video. Uh, hi, Sar. Namaste. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now let's move on. We only got to level two <laughs> or thing number two, but I have five things I want to teach, and we've already been going for one hour. Let's see what time it is. All right. I'm going to go quickly. <laughs> faster with these so we get to the point and if you have questions I'll save those for the end. Wow, this eraser is just not not very good. All right what are we talking about next? Okay uh, I gave some examples of this before. Let's use uh, let's use blue. Maybe this is easier to erase. So number three here uh, we want to go from physical to figurative. So physical, meaning I have like a, a physical thing in my hand or something I can touch or see. And then figurative is more like a, just a, an idea. So something maybe I can't physically touch it, but often these things are linked. And especially in language, when we're learning something, uh, as an example, I might have, here, where is a, uh, like a piece of paper? And get a piece of paper where this, I have a file folder over here. So I have this file folder and I'm, if I'm teaching my own kids this, I can physically show them, look, I'm going to turn it over, turn over, turn over. So a very easy thing, a nice simple phrasal verb that you can learn, turn over. So I'm switching from one side of this to the other, to turn something over, turn something over, right? So this is a physical example you can see of learning the language, but we want to maybe see how this might work figuratively in other situations. And so this is a phrasal verb, it's two different words right here, turn over, but maybe we get a phrasal noun, which really just become its own word right now. Turn over, so turn over, like if we're talking about this in a business context, this is the turnover of staff or the turnover of employees where we get somebody comes into the company and they quit and then we get somebody new that comes in and then they quit and then somebody new comes in and they quit like that. This is known as turnover. So how, how high or what is the rate of, in, of uh, like employee turnover? So maybe at like, a, you know, like the first level, the lowest level of employee at McDonald's or something. Maybe the turnover is, I don't know, one year or six months. I don't know how long it is, but it's just how long does someone stay in a job before they quit? That's the turnover, turnover, okay? So we begin with something, again, a physical idea, and this is how most kids are learning. They're not, I don't begin talking with my kids about turnover at jobs. <laughs> So they would not understand what that means. But I could get them to understand if I begin with something like this. And I say, look, so we're gonna turn something over. I have, here's my hand, I'm gonna turn my hand over, turn my hand over. Or if I'm lying on my back, I might turn over. I might tell someone to turn over. So it means go over on the other side, the opposite side. And so it's the same thing here. We begin with something, and now we're on the opposite side figuratively, okay? So we get turn over, same kind of thing. So when I'm teaching my kids, we're always focusing on physical things first, 
we very rarely would start with something figurative and then try to help them understand it like that. It is possible to do that, but most of the time kids are learning things physically uh, and understanding a lot of the differences like that. I'll give you some more examples. So let's say we have, where's my eraser? Another thing we want to do that natives are learning uh, is we're trying to compare different things. So imagine I have two flashcards over there. I'm teaching tall versus high. And I could explain that. I could like, you know, try to give a figurative or more complex explanation of the difference between uh, high and tall, but it's much easier just to see the difference, to see the difference. So if we're talking about something being tall, like let's say we talk about, I don't know, a tall building uh, or even like a tall, like a tall, let's say, say this is a person. All right, just draw this as a person. Like, wow, that person is very tall. So this person over here is a short, short person. But this person is tall. This person is tall. But how do we express high? So we have a tall person, like this is a tall person compared to this one, but a high person, well I suppose it, <laughs> there might be some different, different uses of high in this, but if we're just talking about the physical one, I might be talking about like a person up here. So there's some space between that person and the ground. So this person from the ground to here means tall, but from here there's actually space. This person is up higher. All right, so this person up at high, and this person is lower down, okay? So when I'm teaching kids, I really want to make sure they understand physically something they can see and to try to help them by comparing things. It's more difficult to just try to show one picture and say, what is this? This is why you often see maybe adjective flashcards. It's like hot and cold or short and... I don't know, short and long or fast and slow. People often teach these things in the same way because the brain understands them. Uh, another one. Yes, so we've got the high example as well. <laughs> so that's a different example. I'm not teaching my kids high in that sense, but they would still, if we want to use that example, like to think even more figuratively about like someone getting high and you could be high on many things. You could be high on alcohol or high on some kind of drug, high on life. It means you're just like, wow, I like really feel I'm in a good mood all the time. I just feel I'm in like a high state of mind, okay? So it's not only talking about drugs or whatever, uh, but you get the same kind of idea of, of you're moving up like, mm, wow, I'm feeling, feeling high. Well, well, konnichiwa, hiro desu, Rocky. Another Rocky, we got two Rockies in the chat right now. All right, so if you remember this, again, we're going from physical to figurative. We really want to help kids understand we get a foundation of things. You really, so you get fluent in the physical thing, then you can also become fluent in the figurative examples as well, all right? If you have any questions about that, let me know. See if I had any more examples. I'll give a few more um, just about this because this is another thing that I notice uh, adult learners also struggle with. So we might have something like, like which do we use if we're talking about a day uh, or a time? So do we do something at some time or on some time or in some time? We could use all those even for um, like particular, like each one of those could be in a, in a situation. But if I just want to do something like I have gym class on a particular, like on a particular day. So I can imagine like days of the calendar, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I can be physically on these as I'm walking. So I'm like walking on them and trying to help my kids understand these things physically. So if we use a day like this, we say on that day. So if I'm walking like where I could put a magnet on that day, okay? So they, rec they remember, ah, oh, okay, so on this day, on this day we do something, all right? Or if we talk about time, we can have like the hands of a clock are moving like this. And so the hands of the clock are moving around. And so we have like one hand over here. So this hand is at this part in the time. So if I talk about like a class, a class is on, so on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. So the, right, out, right now the hand is at this time or the hand is at that time, all right? It's like, where am I? Where is the location? It's at this thing. 
So we don't really say on because it could be like, you know, almost like upside down or something. But this is, again, just using a way of taking something physical to help a kid understand something that's figurative, like time. All right. So time isn't like a physical thing you can touch, but we have, you know, a way of explaining that using something physical. All right. Make sense? So all the, the, the things that I'm doing with my kids, I'm trying to be uh, very systematic and trying to make it very easy for them to understand so they become fluent speakers. All right, let's see if I have anything else. Uh, I think the last two things I'll do very quickly, they are connected with each other. And these are also notice uh, things that you can do as well. So look for ways to understand things physically. Uh, number four, uh, this is something, especially for kids, it's very important, but it could be uh, important for you as well. And this is the morning. I'm not writing very well. M-O-R-N-I-N-G. So the morning routine, and we'll do an evening one as well. Evening. <laughs> I-N-G. So we have the morning routine and the evening routine. And usually... Routine, morning routine. So you might have something like this in, you know, whatever, as you get ready for work or something. Maybe you have some shows in the morning that you like to watch. Children usually have something similar. There are some TV shows like Japanese TV shows. Uh, you watch those in the morning and it's the same thing every morning almost. The point is to make it nice and easy for kids to have a routine, but this is giving them naturally varied review. Naturally varied review. Yes, a doctor's handwriting, I know. <laughs> yes, it's my it's me trying to be fast as I as I go through these examples. All right. So what I recommend you do is you get a same or the same kind of morning routine that kids have. And I recommend you watch something that it's it's got lower level English, so don't watch something difficult or listen to something difficult. Uh, if you're not ready for that, again, you should understand at least 80 to 90 percent of what your your like the content that you're trying to learn. So in this one, maybe you watch or listen to like a couple of kids shows. Uh, I think maybe a few a few students use like Sesame Street uh, or uh, like Peppa Pig or I don't know, Paw Patrol or whatever. It could be anything like that, but something that's a nice, simple kids show that will still give you lots of input and actually teach you a lot of things if you pay attention to that. All right. But you should think about this for the morning, even 15 minutes or 20 minutes of just listening to some shows. If you don't have that on television, just make it on YouTube. All that stuff is available and you can create uh, like a morning routine that's just for you. Okay, boss baby, there you go. So all those things you could watch. Uh, and then the same thing for going to bed. So usually we have in the evening some kind of bedtime story, some kind of routine, like we're brushing teeth and I'm talking about how the day was or asking questions or something. Uh, but then we usually have some reading that we do. So I might have my kids read something they are practicing reading. Uh, but I also read them stories as well. And I will read the same story in different ways. I'm trying to give them more naturally varied review. All the same things that I recommend you do, again, these are the same things I teach to my own kids. All right. So these are the things I recommend. We want to, if we go back and let's see, I'm going to get too high on the board here, getting too high up. All right. So there, again, we have another example of that to get high up on the board right down here is low on the board, but high up on the board here. Uh, so the first thing we had was uh, subject verb agreement. Oh my goodness, agree. Subject verb agreement. Uh, and then we had number two, exceptions. Oh my goodness, that's really loud. And then we've got learning from physical to the figurative. We've got a morning routine and we've got an evening routine as well. So these are all things that you can do very easily. And also if you have kids and you want to help them learn English, these are the same things you can do with them. Also, you should get Frederick for, especially for kids if they're trying to learn uh, the language, but you can find that in the description below this video. And now I will answer some questions with the time that we have left. All right. Uh, anybody here? Let's see. Yep. So turn over a new leaf. Uh, in that way, we would we would use like turn over. It's actually two different words. 
to turn over because we're talking about whoop, like turn over a new leaf, turn over a new leaf. But you might have turn over for the year, turn over for the year. And if you listen to the slight difference in the pronunciation, like turn over, turn over, turn over. But the opposite is turn over. So the phrasal noun, uh, I erased it, but so this is like more of like a rising intonation. So turn over, turn over. Or we have it turned down, like for, for the phrasal noun, turn over, turn over, all right? Uh, let's see, all right, I got that, all right. My classmates couldn't come here, they're already asleep. I am the only night owl. Well, that's why we have recorded videos, so tell them to watch it in the morning. <laughs> they can be, that can be their morning routine. Is it still live? Yes, it's live for a couple more minutes, Salima. All right, uh, so it makes sense. Hi on weed. Oh my goodness, someone had to go there. Yes, of course. Doctor's handwriting, yes. Uh, Brittany, I just watched the movie Joker in English. The actors speak very, very fast, and I got to know about Cockney accent. Uh, can you speak in a Cockney accent? Not, not well. It's like, shine your boots, governor. You know, <laughs> like th this is, this is the, the, the idea of the Cockney accent that, uh, that, that Native Americans uh, or American speakers would know about that, like what we see in movies. It's like, like, where, like you got a license for that, you know, <laughs> asking, asking people if they have a license for something. Uh, but that, that's the Cockney accent, accent we know. So what is Frederick? Uh, it is the world's first app that will teach you English all in English, which is especially important for kids, but it also shows uh, adults step-by-step step how to learn vocabulary and improve pronunciation. A lot of basic grammar, the kinds of things that we talk about, subject-verb agreement that's all reviewed in the app without teaching you grammar rules. So you learn it all naturally. All right. Uh, teacher, please, what's the difference between specialty and es what is specially and especially? Especially before you go. Ah, like the difference between those two words, especially. Uh, like we, I mean, I don't know if people would use like specially, like especially would be the correct way for most, most situations. Like I, I especially like doing something, but it's longer to say. So people will eliminate the E from it and just say like, yeah, especially, especially like doing that. But especially would be the thing you would say. So maybe, maybe there's some other example I'm not thinking of at the moment, but I mean, in general, that, that would be what, what it is. All right, Duck says, uh, sometimes it's frustrating to speak with native speakers. Yeah, uh, you can explain a bit more why that is, but typically learners have trouble with natives because the speech is too fast. Uh, there are too many difficult words and phrases like slang or idioms, uh, or it's just hard to understand. And then you also have your own speech. So maybe you're not able to communicate as quickly as you'd like, or you still have to think and translate. Uh, so really the solution to that is to stop trying to speak and start just getting more input, more understandable messages that help you understand English like a native. So that's what we do in Fluent for Life. All right, uh, La Vie de Red, I understand everything, but when it comes to expressing my opinion, I'm going blank. So it, it could be, again, like this is the typical problem learners have. So if you watch the video recently I have about um, like the three levels of fluency. So we begin with exposure, where you're just hearing something. You might recognize a word or, or know it. It's, it's, it's kind of at like, the, like the, the understanding, the recognition level. So we have just being exposed where you hear something, but then you're, you're able to recognize it. Uh, and most people are at the recognizing level. Uh, they're not actually at the, the, the fluent level where they own the language, the ownership level. But watch that video and it talks about that. And really the, the way to get from the second level to the third level is to get more naturally varied review, more examples. So you just need to know the language uh, and understand it much better. Especially that the video about how to speak fluently about almost anything is also talking about that same idea where students think they know something. I gave the example in that video about my daughter, uh, Aria. I was walking with her to school uh, and she asked me, what does harsh mean? So some people who watch my videos regularly, you will remember this example. But new people, uh, maybe you will not. So I'll just give it again quickly. Uh, so typically in a regular English class, someone would say, okay, here's the word harsh. 
harsh means this, and then we're going to like maybe give you a translation if you still don't understand it. But what I want to do for my kids, just like we're talking about in this video, is really help them understand things like a native so they speak like one. So children are not born native, they become native over time as they learn English as a first language. And so you can do the same thing. All right. So when I'm giving her examples of that, I say, wow, like the sun is kind of harsh today. So it's, it's really, really very bright. And in the example, she was asking me about the word because she had heard that in a TV show in Boss Baby. Uh, and so she's, she's like, what does harsh mean? And I say, well, what does that, like, what was the situation? What was happening when you heard that? And one character was yelling at another and another character said, uh, don't be so harsh. So like, don't say like harsh things or don't be too cruel or too difficult or too severe. And so as my daughter gets more examples of that, she feels more confident about it without me telling her what the definition is. So I want her to discover that rather than me just tell it. All right. So people definitely need more examples of things and that's what's going to help you speak. Rather than trying to study more words and phrases, you should get more examples of the vocabulary you already know but don't use fluently. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, love, love, I don't know what the, what the pronunciation there is. Sir, how do you actually speak? I mean, you say in these video, you might, you speak a bit slowly for people to understand, but how do you naturally say something? All right, well, I'll give you a quick example of how I speak. Uh, number one, I'm a little bit faster like this, but I also might use some like slang and idioms. It's like, yeah, the other day I was, I don't know, what was I doing yesterday? I don't know, I was getting into some kind of trouble uh, doing doing whatever. And, and and even right now, I can't think of like a specific thing I wanted to say. I was out actually with my family. We like, we went to town on this, uh, I don't know, this, it, it, there was like a buffet we went to at this party. It was actually really interesting. There's a lot of Japanese people there. I was speaking with them as well. Um, but like we, like it, it, it's even kind of like hard to explain uh, what we were doing, but it, it was a lot of fun. You know, we went there, had a lot of good time, and you know, tried a whole bunch of different food, and and it was a potluck, I think. So we had to bring some things, and my wife was like, eh, "I don't know what to make," you know, and and I was thinking, "All right, well, we could just buy something." You know, it's maybe that's not as cool as. Uh, taking something by yourself and making something by yourself like you don't have like the love in it if you just buy something but whatever so there uh, that was me just quickly explaining something and not doing like a very good job not being very thoughtful about it uh, but you, maybe you heard a few phrases in there that I would not use unless I'm actually doing like I don't know trying to teach people about uh, particular words and phrases like to go to town on something <clears throat> to go to town on something, to go to town on something. So this is me. Number one, I'm speaking like I'm mumbling a little bit more, so I'm not as clear. I'm using some idioms like that, some faster language and things that it's, it's really going to be more difficult for people to understand if I don't make it clear about what that is. So if I say, we went to town on a buffet, a lot of native speakers will, well actually pretty much any native speaker will understand what I'm talking about, but many learners will not. They will be like, what does that mean? Went to, he went to town on a buffet. What does that mean? Like, was I like riding on that? So a buffet is, you have like a big, like an all, it's like an all you can eat. It wasn't really all you can eat, but you had, it just means like lots of, lots of food laid out uh, on a, on like a, a long table, something like that, a buffet. So we went to town on that. It means like we, we got there and we were like, Rah! everyone came and we were eating lots of food. We were like, I don't know, like locusts. Yeah, like a pig out kind of same kind of thing. So we went to town on something. To go to town on something. All right. But notice that if I'm, if I'm not taking time to explain that, it's often going to be... Uh, it's going to be too advanced or too fast for a lot of people to follow. So they will be thinking like, what does that mean? He went to town on something, but, and I'm still talking. So I'm still going and explaining and talking about whatever, uh, but it's going to be more difficult for people. All right. So I don't, I don't necessarily speak quickly all the time, but the, the, di the more difficult thing is the vocabulary. So I don't use a lot of idioms and slang and things like that, that I might use in a regular conversation with friends of mine. So it's again, if you're over here and you want to get to fluency, which is like a higher level of vocabulary and communication and vocabulary, it's really difficult to jump 
directly up here. This is why we take you up in steps in Fluent for Life. All right, so we wanna make sure you understand the vocabulary and the grammar and the speed and all of these things. And as you go through the steps, it's much easier to understand the conversation at the end. All right, and that's how you get fluent. All right, you can hear I'm losing my voice over here. How much time we have? I've got like only a little bit left. How many, less, uh, how many times do you live lessons here on YouTube monthly, says Andre. Uh, I don't have a, like a specific schedule. Lately, I've been doing maybe at least once a week. Uh, I don't have a specific schedule, but it's usually around this time I've been, been doing that. Uh, let's see, Sleaze is with all said and done. How does one choose which vocabulary? Uh, they should learn or teach? Should it be vocabulary that resonates with the student's life, like when your wife was pregnant? Um, yeah, it, it, just, it just depends on the situation. And then I would see what, what did natives do in that situation. And that's all I was doing with the, like the, the pregnant wife example. So I'm not, I don't, I don't go into a textbook and think about like what, does, like, what do you need for that? I just look at like, what are these doctors talking about? What, what are the specific situations that I need to talk about? And it's like, oh, what's the name of like, I don't know, gynecologist or whatever? Or how do you say that in Japanese? Or how do you talk about pregnancy? Or how do you talk about, you know, like certain cultural things? Uh, and you learn that by just focusing on, on the different examples that natives would have for that same thing. So if I, just like in the espresso video, how do you make an espresso? So someone, if you have a student who works at a coffee shop, then that would be a good, a good thing for them to focus on. So how do, you, how do you respond to customers when they order something? And I, I gave the example, or I have given the example many times on the channel about when I was learning uh, Japanese and I came to Japan and after I, I struggled for a year and still couldn't speak, and I discovered, oh, like you just need to understand the language like a native. And so I would go to coffee shops and sit near the counter and listen to people ordering food. <laughs> so I would sit there, I'd pretend like I'm reading a book, but I'm just spying on people. I'm just listening. What are they saying? So you have a whole line of people. It's like free, naturally varied review. So all these people are going to order. They might order, you know, a coffee or different things, but they're going to have like a similar range of things that they would say. So I'd say like, I don't know, like listening to different people order stuff. If I'm, if I want to know how to order food in, a, in like a country or whatever, I want to get a bunch of examples. Now you might see this sometimes on YouTube, like people will give an example of one situation. So how to order or how to check in at a hotel. All right, so they will give like one example of that. What you should see is like 20 different people checking into a hotel, and that's going to make you feel very confident about that. So you can find lots of these examples uh, on YouTube as well, but these are the kinds of things we do in Fluent for Life. Like, what do we do when we're, we're talking about like relationships? How do different people talk about that? Or how do we have, um, I don't know, like explaining idioms in one situation in another one? So we cover all this stuff in the program. Uh, let's see, and Julian says, when engaging in conversation with non-native speaker, it is natural for a native speaker to adjust their pace of speech, speaking more slowly in order to ensure better comprehension. Yes. So people will, I, I, like, the, the word for this is code switching, code switching, if you've not heard that before. But yeah, so people will speak one way. I know, like, my mother would do that to... to so there's like a, and this is like the, the really bad way of speaking to non-natives. She was like, like my mother will, like she comes out to Japan to, to visit. And when she's trying to speak English to some Japanese people, like, or even to my own kid, she's like, she's like, you go, you go there. <laughs> like, why are you speaking to them like that? Speak, speak normally. Like the whole point is for them to understand how you speak uh, not for you to like code switch and, and start speaking in, a, in an easier to understand way. Uh, there are some times when it's useful to do that, but don't go to the, like the really <laughs> like really low robot level because if people don't understand go or you or whatever, then they're not going to understand anything at all. All right, harshness builds character. That's true. All right, uh, let's see. And, okay, I got those already. All right, watching from India, sir. Aha, naturally varied review. Yes, 
That's the, that's the secret. I try to make this very simple for people when they're like, what should I do? What, what do I do? Naturally varied review, that's the answer. So you're, you need to get understandable messages, and that means you're needing real, actual native speech, and then you're getting natural lessons that help you understand and really discover the meaning of things for yourself, and you do that by getting lots of examples. So that's what the naturally varied review does. All right, hello again, says Dim Paul. All right, looks like we got through everybody. 92 minutes. Oh my goodness, an hour and a half. All right, let me celebrate with my, if you remember what this is. It's not rum. I know you might be thinking it's rum, but it's not rum. It's some delicious mint tea that my wife made for me. Some delicious mint tea. All right. So very quickly to sum up, to conclude this. Number one, I really want you to, to, to take this to heart. Take this to heart. Really listen to this. Really pay attention to this. Use it and it will get you fluent. Subject verb agreement, and you will see this like even higher level ones like I just covered in this video with examples. If you master the basics, con conversation becomes much easier, much, much smoother. Uh, and then you don't have to think about like basic errors in, in conversations and be worried about that. Number two, we want to think about exceptions. So these are things like irregular verbs or plurals that change like going from foot to feet or from go to went, all right? So if it's like play, played, listen, listened, talk, talked. But then we have, I don't know, run, ran. That's a difference you need to pay attention to because you need to hear that again and again in different ways to really get that pattern in your brain, you know, to push it deep into your mind. Number three, we want to go from physical things to figurative. So the example I gave, we have turnover. So we have physical hand like this. It's easy to see. I want to whoop, show the other side of that. I'm going to turn my hand over or I could turn my whole body over. Like if I'm getting a massage and the masseuse says, hey, could you please turn over, turn over. So that's another situation I had to learn like the Japanese for that, all right? So it's like aomuke or uh, utsubuse. So like, okay, I have to learn like what, what are people telling me to do? And I understood like, ah, oh, like aomuke, like looking, looking up. And people even use different, different terms for that. But in English, just turn over. Or you could say lie on your back or lie on your stomach. Same kind of thing, all right? But we want to go from physical to figurative. And then four and five, we have different routines which you can create for yourself, usually in the morning when you're getting ready for work or at night before you're going to bed. Those are good times when you have your own time to do something. Uh, but plan this out, all right? If you don't have a TV uh, or don't have particular channels, just watch something on YouTube. Kids cartoons or kids TV shows are great for that. You can find lots of old examples as well. If you want to remember, I don't know, like, like let's say you are, I don't know, 40 years old. So if you meet with native English speakers who are 40 years old, like within that same age group, if you watch kids cartoons from the 1980s, then you will be able to talk with people about that. Hey, do you remember that show we used to watch? Like, yeah, that was like, oh, I know that show. <laughs> so I know like Thundercats is an example from the 1980s when I was a kid. And so if I meet someone and they understand that reference, like, ah, like I can talk about Thundercats. So it's the same thing. So you can, you can think about what you need for your life, but also the kinds of people that you speak with in your life. So if I spend my time taking care of old people, then I should probably learn some vocabulary about, you know, the kinds of things that they watched or whatever. Um, and I can also learn about the things that they, uh, that they use, like the vocabulary they use, all right? So these are the, like the native tricks, the native secrets, the native strategies that I use because I don't honestly have a lot of time to teach my own kids English. So I have to be very strategic and, and really do my best uh, to give them a lot in a little amount of time. All right. All right. Let's see. I'll answer some last questions here. Uh, and then that should be, uh, let's see. Can you make a new video like the one with espresso? Oh, like another, another naturally varied review video. Uh, well, if, if people have a particular topic they'd like to see, that really you can do this by yourself. The, the, the benefit of having a teacher is I can explain the vocabulary, uh, but you can certainly go and find even more videos of whatever topic you're interested in uh, and learn about that same thing. 
Uh, let's see, Salisa, thank you so much, Drew. Glad to hear it. Uh, you don't understand how much you've made my job so much more easier and enjoyable. Glad to hear it. <laughs> nice. Uh, do you teach like by yourself, or do you have a school you work for, or or something else? Uh, I'm join uh, FFL before the end of this month. It's quite challenging to convince some students. Ah, you you want to like get get them in the program? I'm guessing. But if you do, yeah, it'd be uh, a pleasure to welcome you. Let's see. So let's see, okay, we've got like a couple of videos asking about that. Can I make a new video like this? Press a one. <laughs> Julian says, thank you, uh, because they're so used to traditional ESL way. Yeah, uh, I, I would have your students watch some of my videos and explain like why people can, can I, I remember having a, uh, like there was a guy, I think a Korean guy, and he lives in Texas with his wife. And uh, he bought one of my programs. He had to return it because his wife was like, no, I can't learn it unless there's Korean. <laughs> so she wanted to learn Korean and he, he just like felt really bad. He was like, I don't know what to do. My wife really just wants the Korean in the examples, you know. Well, uh, I understand, but it's, it's going to stop people from communicating. All right. Uh, I teach on I talk he and privately. Ah, glad to hear. Uh, what is the best, how the best, a way to watching movies to learn? Yeah, I would, I would watch shows for kids based on your writing, like, the, like the, the errors in your writing. Your English is probably not good enough to watch movies all in English. And you should be watching stuff all in English that you can understand in that language. All right. All right. Well, it looks like that's it. It's been a pleasure. Hopefully you guys take these tips and you apply them to your learning. Once you start understanding like a native, you really will see a difference uh, in the way you communicate. And I promise you will feel a lot more confident and fluent. Can you say thought? Thought. If you'd like to hear me say over 2,000 words and sentences, just get Frederick. You can hear me, you can hear me, hear me say thought like a thousand times if you like. <laughs> All right, have a nice day from Brussels. Have a fantastic day wherever you are. If you'd like to learn more about both Fluent for Life and Frederick, you can click on the links in the description below this video, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.